I was born in Hurrican. My family moved around quite a bit. Hurricane being a poor little town and us being a very poor family, we're always looking for work. Aunt Darla was his older sister. She got married very young, but she had a chicken farm. And one summer she hired my dad to come up and help out on the farm. And I don't know that she really needed that much help, but it was a good chance for her to spend time with her brother. My dad needed some money. And he said being among that many chickens all day long, feeding and cleaning up after him and stuff, he said it would start to sound like they were talking. And so he could hear chicken voices throughout the day saying, Rand, Rand, or, you know, <laughs> he imagined all kinds of things the chickens were saying and it just about drove him crazy. Dad used to work for the, the local orchards and stuff during harvest. He was pretty busy. I have the renown of being the champion cherry picker in the large orchard that was close to our house. I think I picked about 650 pounds in one day, which was more than anybody else had done, so I, I have that to my distinction, whatever good that is. And there was one summer where he, he made $50 off of picking cherries and bought a, a 22 rifle from a gunsmith with the $50 that he made. They were young, they weren't supposed to have guns until they were, I can't remember, 16 or something. He and his friend, I think it was Floyd, went out to the, the dump and they were shooting the 22s in the dump, you know, just setting up bottles on the edge of the cliff. And they saw a car coming up the road towards the dump and recognized it as the sheriff. Let's hide him in the trash. He'll come and, and we can just retrieve him after he's gone. And the sheriff came up and he was dumping off beer bottles that he'd collected and went right over to where the guns were, pulled them out and said, well, my lucky day, look at this. I just found two perfectly good. Who would throw away two great rifles like this? And Dad and Floyd, uh, sir, those uh, actually belong to us. Um, he said, I'm gonna let you off the hook. I don't want you guys to lose your perfectly good rifles. Here you go. But uh, heading back into town, the highway patrol and the local cops are not gonna be so kind. You're going to have to figure out a way to uh, to keep these hidden. Happy shooting, boys. <laughs> I remember a, a few bedtime stories about Honey the goat, the troublesome goat that would always get out of the <laughs> pen and cause, cause trouble. I always loved the stories about the milk goats and especially one honey-colored one that was named Honey and how she would always escape from the goat pen and let all the other goats out and was always doing naughty, capricious things. So one day, my dad and his friend, they were starting to grow peach fuzz. They were at that age and they decided that they were going to shave it off. My dad's friend's father had a shaving chair out on his back porch and my dad tells his friend, why don't you sit down first and I'll shave your peach fuzz for you. So his friend sat down. My dad, you know, takes the brush and lathers up the soap and puts it on his friend's face. And then he reaches for the razor and they had one of those leather straps attached to the chair that, you know, you'd sharpen the razor on. And my dad takes and goes to sharpen the, the razor and sliced through the, the leather strap. And he thought, ooh, okay, it's good and sharp. I guess we're ready to go. He takes the razor and runs it across his friend's shape, uh, face and sees a nice red arc of blood and realized that he had cut a bit too deep. They realized they couldn't get away with just hiding this, they needed help. So they went in to tell the friend's mom. She took one look at her son and she says, oh great, another mouth to feed, because he had cut clean through. <laughs> Wish I knew him when I was little. Was when I was two years old, we lived in Kingston, Utah, which is in the middle of the state. Very harsh there, and I contracted rheumatic fever. The rheumatic fever attacks the heart valves as well as the joints. And he had it so badly that he wasn't able to go to school. I kind of grew up my whole time as a kid, knowing that my dad could pass away at any time. Dad had been concerned from the beginning that he would leave my mom a widow that his heart problems would, would end in his premature death. But my uncle, who's a doctor, was able to get some and we were able to stem the effects of it somewhat. But it was so cold and harsh there that my parents 
move down to Hurricane where it's warmer, but the downside of that was that uh, that was the stake where my father was excommunicated. When dad was a little kid, his parents were polygamous. In, in World War I, he was gassed with mustard gas. Most people who got it died. He was just left with bad lungs the rest of his life. <clears throat> he was a bayonet instructor. He was a big guy and strong, very strong. So yeah, there was one thing where the Germans had ambushed him. And uh, there was a company of 500, and there were five that walked out of it. And he couldn't figure it out. He thought, my gosh, he, he said the shells would come in and the spirit would tell him to move. And so he had moved and a shell had hit where he had just been. And so he felt like that, uh, that uh, the heavens had a, a special calling for him. He thought maybe he was going to be uh, another Jesse Knight and develop a successful mine. And so he had mines around. One of them's out in the Grand Canyon. Our family has gone out to that a number of times. It's a beautiful place. The reason he was doing it was more because he had some social issues because of being gassed. So getting out to the Grand Canyon away from everybody and working really hard and trying to provide for his family. He had a lot of very difficult experiences that kind of marred him for the rest of his life. I don't think he was mentally straight since then and I think he was he easily got roped into polygamy by a cousin because of he wasn't mentally stable enough to make a good decision. But uh, the bishop came to visit them one day and he told Grandpa Covington, if you will not teach this to the younger kids, they will be able to grow up, become members of the church, and live normal, good lives like they're meant to and told him if he just didn't bring it up or, or discuss it with the family, that eventually it would just kind of go away like it had never happened kind of thing. So I, I don't think they talked about it a whole lot. But Dad said that it was, it was obvious that he wanted to tell them why they were suffering, but there was no reasonable way to do that. And so he, he just didn't. Uh, my father was treated really poorly by a lot of people in town because of the polygamy in his roots. When my dad's sister Iris was in kindergarten, um, she was walking home from school. Iris was the one that was his sibling that he was the closest to. She was coming home from school and had to cross the busy street. I think she was kind of being teased by some kids. She didn't want to walk on our side of the street because there were some nasty little boys that would, would hurt her, throw rocks at her. That's growing up in Hurricane. And uh, so she waited until she got to our place and the speed limit was faster. There was a lady that had been drinking and had lost her good judgment. And, and my little sister Iris um, tried to cross the street and, and got hit and was killed. It was a dark time in her family. It really broke her hearts to lose her. She's a beautiful little girl. And uh, she's lovely. It about broke my parents' hearts. That was the only time that he ever saw his father cry. My dad lost two sisters that way. And growing up, my dad always had a, a venom towards drinking and driving. He's a very kind person, very kind hearted and very forgiving, but that was something he always had zero tolerance for. We knew dad's mom as Birdie, and she was a wonderful lady. Interesting um, to consider that she was in a small town because she was a very sophisticated lady. She loved the arts, she loved music, she was into opera, which I totally didn't get at the time. One of the things that I've always been really proud of is that she went to college. For her generation, for her day and age, I don't think that was a super common thing. And for her to, you know, put such a high price or a high value on education always meant a lot to me. The uh, one story, he was uh, bucking hay where you pick up these 70 pound bales of hay and chuck them in the back of a truck all day and uh, just wear you out. And that was when he says he decided that he wanted to go to college and get a job where he could use his mind instead of his body. <laughs> you can't do that for a whole lifetime. My mom and dad had been in a class together at Dixie. I saw him, he was with the Hurricane Boys. The Hurricane Boys were well, well respected at Dixie. I knew all the Hurricane Boys except this one. And he was tall and good looking and 
the minute I saw him, just something clicked. And my dad sat right up at the front of the class. He was very studious and very serious about school. And, and my girlfriend, Margaret Force and I would sit about three or four rows up so that we could, in the reflection of the overhead projector, I could see this guy that I was so anxious to meet. And my dad was so tall and handsome that my mom liked to look at him. She hadn't met him yet. And my mom sat a few rows back and she noticed him. And she thought that he was really cute, but she couldn't catch his eye. He just, he was too, too focused on his education. And so I watched him all through class, didn't get my child mythology, but. <laughs> I had hopes and dreams um, of what I wanted life to be. And I, I dated some really pretty girls. But when I met Liz, uh, did she tell you the event? So my mom and dad met, I believe it was a church dance, and it was at Veo, and that's a town that's in southern Utah, just outside St. George. And they were having a great time. My mom had danced with a lot of guys. And, and some of the girls from St. George came over and sat with us. One of the girls I knew well because I'd played ping pong with her at the Institute, and uh, she had this friend. Elizabeth <laughs> and, and I went over and got some food, got in line, got a sloppy joe and some other food and came back and sat at the table across from Liz. And for some reason I reached across the table and took a sloppy joe and took a bite of it. But to do something bold like that was totally out of character for her and it's perfect. It's like she had this crush on him and she was determined to meet him and so she went outside of what was normal for her so that she could get his attention. You know, she took that first step so she could meet this guy. And that got my dad's attention. <laughs> <laughs> kind of let him know like, hey, I'm here. <laughs> She's being very flirty and very playful. I said, well, you know, if you want that, go ahead and keep it. I'll go get another one. He said, well, if you're that hungry, you could have mine and I'll go get another one. My dad was walking over to ask uh, one of my mom's friends to dance and somebody else came in and swooped in before he got there as he was walking over there and asked that girl to dance. And so my dad was already walking towards my mom. He's like, oh, okay, I guess I'll ask the sloppy Joe thief to dance. So anyway, I asked her and we got out and danced and she shared a little of her life with me and I shared a little with her. And she's a lovely dancer and a beautiful girl. And uh, the more we talked, the better I liked her. We had a date every weekend after that for the five months before he went on his mission. And anyway, I wanted to go on a mission badly. I, I realized where I'd been, and I really needed the strength that a mission would give me. And so we talked about it. I'd love to have married her right then, but I felt like it was best for both of us if I went on a mission. We decided that I would wait and date. And he said, you need to date. Don't wait for me. And if you're still here when I get back, that'll be great. I hope that's the case, but you need to be free and you need to continue to live your life while I'm away. I know she got proposed to at least twice. At least one guy tried to propose to my mom while my dad was on his mission. Um, this guy came to her and he said that the Lord had revealed to him that they were meant to be together. And my mom was so awesome to stand up for herself. And she said, you know, I need the revelation too. So I'll look into it and I'll get back to you. And he went to Buffalo, New, Buffalo, New York on his mission. The Hill Camor is up in his mission um, boundaries. Members of the church can go up and be in the pageant, uh, Hill Camorra pageant. And my mom decided to do that. She went up and was in the pageant and my dad was in the pageant too. And so she did get to see him a little bit. And so I tease my mom and I'm like, so did you guys like sneak off? Even though he is a missionary, she's like, no, actually I barely saw him, but it was still really fun being in the same area as him and just knowing he was there. She sent letters regularly. She sent boxes of, of flowers. She sent a box of uh, lilacs. That was so wonderful. New York was a tough mission. There are a lot of traditional things, a lot of areas where Catholicism is real high and, and they 
stand to close their minds to religion. And we saw miracles. Uh, one lady with her her boy, they were alone in the world. There's just her, her and her little boy, they'd lost her, her husband. And she was facing cancer surgery. It was really sketchy. She asked for a blessing. My companion and I went into the hospital and gave her a blessing. And just before they took her in for the surgery, they said, well, let's take one more scan to make sure we know where it is. And they took a scan, it was gone. Things like this, and then the spirit whispering to tell us to go down this street or do this or that. Uh, it was a grand experience. And uh, my testimony was really enhanced by the experience I had on my mission. I was delighted to come home and Liz had waited. I'm sure she'd had some offers that she refused because she's a lovely woman, but so happy that she was there. The, the she's type of woman that when she knows she wants something, she knows she wants it. And so I think knowing my dad and knowing what kind of person he is, I think she was able, I know that she dated guys while he was gone, but I don't think that any of them measured up. My mom always knew from, you know, when they first started dating that my dad had a bad heart. Well, I really worried about it before I married him. She asked for some advice because she was like, I really like this guy. I would really like to marry him, but he's got this bad heart. He could drop dead at any moment. This is kind of terrifying. Would you advise me to go ahead with the relationship or to cut it off? And Dr. Reitman said, any of us could go out on the street and get hit today. You know, don't let that deter you from from following your heart and doing what you think is best. I just loved her dearly at the time and I love her even more now. She was beautiful, she was talented, she's accomplished. Anything she decided to do, she would, she would accomplish. She was a good tennis player. So my mom is really good at tennis and she taught us how to play tennis when we were growing up. And she was really good at ping pong. We used to turn our dining room table into a ping pong table by just putting a little net on it. When I was dating him, we decided to play a game of tennis, and I, I loved to play tennis. We went to the tennis court and played a game, and I beat him. Well, that was the last game of tennis that we ever played. My mom was studying home ec economics. She always knew that she wanted to be a mother. So growing up, my mom loved to do everything that was home ec type stuff. I, I call her Betty Crocker. <laughs> she was the home ec. She won some home ec award. I won the, the award for the best homemaker in our school one year. Um, every year, and I think her senior year, the teacher came to her and said, Betty, you deserve this. However, we need to give somebody else a chance to win it. My mom was really big into sewing her own dresses. They couldn't necessarily afford the really high fashion dresses and the local fabric store they would take the dress patterns and if if the packaging was damaged at all they just throw them in the garbage can so my mom and her friend went and were dumpster diving <laughs> stealing like dress patterns to go home and make dresses which to me seems super super innocent but the police pulled up and pulled them out of the dumpsters and we're talking to them about how it's evil to steal and how they should be buying these patterns not stealing them out of the dumpster and I just remember thinking, like, that's just a much more innocent era. <laughs> oh, one time I had 13 cats, counting the mothers and the kittens. One of my cats was named Blackie, and she was a very mellow cat. She let me dress her up in doll clothes and take her in the buggy for a ride. She had lots of cats. I was always jealous growing up because she told me at one point she had 13 cats. And I thought, oh have 13 cats that would be so amazing and she used to like to dress Blackie up in her doll clothes and put on a little bonnet and little dress and then she would put Blackie in her little baby carriage her little baby buggy but my mother and dad must have paid a fortune buying cat food mom and dad's childhoods were very different from each other Mom was the youngest child in a, a family of four with a successful dad. He was a plumber. Grandpa Thompson did very well in the plumbing business and took care of them very well. My dad was special. He was a neat guy. 
He was on the system day as long. He had a hard time holding a flashlight, and so he would hire me to, I guess hired me. I went with him quite often on these jobs to hold the flashlight. But I was a child and I, my mind would drift and I'd see something of interest and the flashlight would go right there. On occasion he'd say, Betty dear, could you just look at what you're shining a flashlight on? That's not where I'm working. And so I thought that was really kind of him to be so so gentle in how he correct me. Grandma Josie was always very openly loving. She was a wonderful person. When we would come to visit, we knew that she was excited to have us there because she was very expressive about that. And she um, used to come and live with us for six months out of the year. I was always like a storyteller and I loved attention. And so I'd go and play a soccer game. And when I came home, she would sit for, I mean, the soccer game was an hour. She'd sit for two hours while I retold the entire game and every single bit of it and reenacted it in front of her. And she loved every minute of her, or at least she acted like she did. Oh, I love my grandma Josie. She was fun. She was kind. She was a great storyteller. She was one of those people that you don't mind sitting down with and just visiting with her. My mother and I just got along like two peas in a pod. My mother was my best friend. I was her favorite child. <laughs> My brothers and sisters don't agree with that, but it's true. <laughs> One of the things that was wonderful is that her mother liked me as well. I don't know, I think the spirit works through people. I felt like I'd known Liz already when I first met her, and her mother was very supportive of us. And uh, it, it was, uh, just felt that support. So when my parents were going to BYU, they were super poor. They talk about they got tax returns and they were so excited they actually got some money back from their tax returns and it was enough to go out for ice cream. <laughs> so that was like their special little treat is they got to go out for ice cream <laughs> with their tax returns. He got to the point where he didn't have enough money to pay the bills and felt like he needed to drop out of school for a little while to earn some money, and then he would try to get back into the program. It was kind of daunting about the time that we were wrestling with that. Here comes an envelope from her, it was her dad's idea with, for, with a check for $500, and that lifted us over the problem. And I thought, you know, they're in touch. Um, my grandpa sensed that my parents needed money and it wasn't prompted by conversation necessarily. He just would have that impression. And miraculously, when my parents needed money the most, they would get a check in the mail. And it was just the amount that they needed, just that bolster. So I remember watching her take care of my grandpa when he was toward the end of his life and just how kind um, and patient she was while she would feed him soup and some of it would come out of his mouth and she would just take care of him. I learned to sew from my mother and to cook and to listen to people and to love to work. She taught us that work was the blessing and that we, anyway, I learned that a lot of joy comes from working. My mom uh, has always been fond of my Uncle Steve. He is a very intelligent person, very fun, very energetic, but also very sensitive and sweet. And so he was a really good big brother to my mom. My mom could tell him anything. He didn't tease her, or if he did, it was not very much. Um, and so she's always uh, really had a, a soft spot in her heart for Steve. Uncle Steve always defended mom. He was a good older brother and was always looking out for her and trying to make sure that her best interests were always in the picture. Yeah, that in family matters, mom took care of Uncle Steve too. She's always been defending him and making sure that he has a voice in the family, which was not naturally the case. And I remember once being at Grandma Josie's house and um, my dad came in and he said, there was just a message, an emergency message on the radio, and it said that there's this white gorilla that escaped from the zoo, and so everybody needs to stay inside. And so I was just sitting there on the bed, just playing around, and then I saw 
what I thought was grandma walked down the hall because there was white kind of like hair and it wasn't grandma. It was the white gorilla and it had a big horn and the horn was broken off and kind of bloody and gorilla turned around and looked at me and woo, 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 and came over at me and I was screaming. I was so scared and come to find out it was Scott with a mask on and my dad had gotten in on that practical joke. Usually it was just Scott doing it, but this time dad got in on it. <laughs> so I went ahead and pursued a degree in chemistry and while I was on my mission, I thought I can teach, I can really teach. So I thought, well, maybe I could teach chemistry on a high school level. So I had a, a chemistry degree with a minor in education and a minor in mathematics so that I could be marketable when I got out. Dad was influenced by some very good teachers. And he believed that most people determine where they want to go in life based on the teachers that they have. And he had some very good teachers in chemistry, and so that's what he pursued. He was very good at it anyway. His passion was really chemistry. And it comes out when he makes candy. He does Christmas candy every year. Making candy is a science, and he was a chemist, so he knew best. People will ask for the recipe, and he'll just say, well, you mix this in, and you've got to get it to just the right temperature and stir it at just the right time, and they want precise steps. And he just has a feel for it. He knows what chemical reactions are happening as you add sugar and the other ingredients. He knows exactly what temperatures things are supposed to be. He knows just when to stir in instinctively. When my parents were young and married, uh, they did have to move around a lot, like a lot of newlywed couples move around a lot, trying to find to finish up schooling or to with different jobs. He ran a water truck when I was a little kid. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Dad would drive down the street, honk his horn, and you know, and I'd wave, and I was so proud that was my dad driving the water truck. That was a pretty prestigious job when you're a little kid. And and bounced around. I was a chemist a couple of times. I for my first year out, I did teach math at Snowflake Union High School, and uh, and then I ended up in St. George. I took a job at the recorder's office there and learned what they were trying to do. We moved to Nevada when I was five years old and we were there until I was seven years old. We were there for two years, and he worked for a, a gold mine in the middle of nowhere, Nevada. That was a really great job. He loved it. It was very challenging. It was very technical, but he didn't feel like that was a great place to raise a family. We would go to church every Sunday in Tonopah, um, and it was an hour drive to get there. An all day thing, like we would leave when it's dark and we wouldn't get home until it was dark. Mom would pack lunches and we would just hang out in the parking lot basically all day long and then drive an hour back. It was a pretty rough community to grow up in. You know, my dad tells stories of taking my oldest brother to softball practice. We had, they had like eight to 12 year old kids and they were already smoking and looking at bad magazines and stuff. And out of the mine, every other word was a swear word. Some I'd never even heard kind of thing. And so all the kids learned those and they were throwing around swear words like they're no big deal. And that was, Hard for me being the goody two-shoes little Mormon from Southern Utah. We found after a couple of years out there that it just wasn't a good environment. The kind of defining moment, so I tried really hard to be a good kid, and it just, it just, you know, never got me anything but more bullying. So I finally told mom and dad, I was super depressed. I tried to run away at one point, and I told them, I said, you know what? It just doesn't pay to be good. I've kind of given up. And they're like, oh, that's not good. And the recorder in Utah County, uh, I don't know how I found out about it, but they needed someone to do mapping for them. And uh, there was an opening in Utah Valley at the recorder's office. Dad had worked doing that before in southern Utah. And so luckily they moved away from Nevada before I was born, moved to Orem. And the home that they are in now is the home that I was brought home from the hospital to and it's the only home I've known. My mom had several miscarriages before and after Scott. I think having Scott was a really good healing thing for my mom. She said she said that she and my dad weren't even sure if they were gonna have any kids at all. I've experienced one miscarriage and it's such a heavy, hard thing to experience. I don't know how my parents have the strength. 
at one point, mom was talking to friends and she said, I lost two babies before Carrie was born. I misunderstood that and thought that maybe mom was was not very good at keeping track of her kids and that they had disappeared as a result of, I was maybe a little more clingy after that. And uh, she decided to try again and had Carrie and then, you know, bam, bam, bam. And I never felt like I was second to anything else that they had going on. I never felt like anything else was more important than me and my siblings. They are each one their own self, their individual. Scott's very strong-willed. He was super cool. He always had the coolest music and the coolest clothes. I do remember that he would babysit us sometimes, and it was sometimes a little bit of an adventure when we would get babysat. Scott was the jokester. He would always play pranks on everybody, and he was super cool. He knew all of the cool music, and he kind of introduced me to some cool music that made me cool later because I knew about it, so I appreciated that. Carrie's always been very sweet extremely thoughtful. He always had a kind heart and he was always seeking to understand other people and where they were coming from. So he would always bike a lot and was pretty athletic that way. Carrie, Carrie's always been the smart one. Russ has always been very intellectual. He learned how to spell before I did. He's two years younger than me. That was a bit of a concern to me at the time that he could spell my name before I could spell my name. He's, uh, he's quite a genius. When he was younger, he got the nickname Moose because my dad said if you messed with the moose, you get the horns. He had a temper like you would not believe. Part of my Moose nickname is that I would get so angry and come at him with windmill fists and everything, but uh, yeah, I don't think I was ever really a threat. He did a lot for my self-esteem. You know, during those years as a teenager, he was talking on the phone with his friend and I thought he pretty much hated me because I was really good at being irritating and annoying and he was really good at being annoyed by me. At one time he was talking to his best friend and I overheard him say, nah, Jason's okay, he's pretty cool. And from that point on, I wanted to be cool. I wanted to be, you know, a good little brother. And he treated me different, I treated him different. We've been great ever since. He would always include me in things, which made me feel really special, especially because he's older than me. Sarah was like the little mom. Like she always took care of everybody. Sarah's amazing, she loves unconditionally. She's the big sister that always has your back. She's compassionate and she's the perfect cheerleader. I always wanted to hang out with her and her friends because they were cool and they were older. So we've got a home movie of Sarah covered in flour and she runs over to the couch and pounds on the couch and makes this big cloud and it was pretty funny. Um, Sarah and I got along great. She was always patient with my shenanigans. And Jason also is so funny. He always makes all of us laugh. At the dinner table, if Jason was there, the noise level was, was extreme because Jason was loud and everybody else had to be loud to keep up with it. If Jason was not at the table, it was pretty quiet. Jason can take any situation, the worst situation, and turn it into an adventure. Um, Jason was the jokester and the runner. He since apologized for being like rude as a kid. I never saw it as rude. I always saw it as fun. We've all had a special love for animals, but Julie, she's taken it to a whole nother level. Julie's super, super smart. Julie's my role model. She's my best friend. She's kind-hearted, loves every kind of animal. So Julie's an animal lover. She always had, Jason and Julie both had a zoo in their rooms pretty much growing up. We, we fought like cats and dogs. If you ask the other siblings who were the biggest rivals in the family, it was probably Julie and I. I like to think that our arguments were entertaining for others. They were probably just annoying. I don't think anybody knows Jenny that doesn't love her. Jenny is really great at, at empathy and of being able to navigate emotions and situations and everything. I felt very protective of her because she was always very sweet and kind-hearted. In our room at night, you know, you're always afraid that those monsters are going to come get you in the night. And I would sleep with my hands outside of my covers so my arms would be ready to fight off the monsters if they came to try to get Jenny. Nick knows how to make things work. He's sensitive to others. He knows how to lift you up and make you feel awesome. So I remember Jason and I taking Nick to go running around the track down at Lake Ridge, just down the street from our house, the junior high. Nick, even as like a little kid, really little, like kindergarten, he was whipping fast. I couldn't believe it. And Jason was even impressed too. He's like, holy cow. He's really good at pushing himself harder than most people would. 
And so it was a lot of fun as an older brother, even though, you know, I could outrun him most of the time we were growing up. He was right on my heels. And that was that was pretty fun to have a brother that could keep up that much. He is the best storyteller ever. I, I always did adventurous kind of stuff. Um, but Nick like took it to the next level. His adventures were like way crazier than anything I ever did. Nick's my protector. He's my older brother. Lisa was always my little sister that I, I wanted to defend. Lisa is a rock star. I feel like even though Lisa is much younger than me, she's much more mature than me. <laughs> We'd be talking about projects at school or spelling bees or whatever. I can spell this, I can spell that. And uh, she said, oh yeah, oh yeah, I can spell uh, Old MacDonald had a farm. And we're like, really? You can spell that? Yeah, yeah, I can spell. Okay, let's hear it. I, oh, old MacDonald had a farm. E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> So Lisa, I loved dressing up also. I liked to sew little clothes for her when she was so little. And I remember making these pants that were like a cotton pants. And then the side, on the side of the leg, it was like kind of gathered up and then I put a bow on it. She looked so cute in those pants. My older brother, Nick, he's two years older than me. Um, my mom had a dream where she had a baby that had dark, dark hair. Several of our children came to me one at a time and asked if I could join our family. When she delivered Nick, which all the rest of us were pretty much towheads when we were born, we all had really, really light hair and it got darker as we got older. But when Nick was born, he had a full head of dark, dark hair. And she was like, this is my baby. This is the one I you know, dreamed about. And and I know whenever she was expecting a baby that she would set an extra plate at the table. And so that was her way of letting the other kids in the family know that she was pregnant and that there was another baby coming. And but I was never there to experience that. So I was the plate at the table. <laughs> but my parents were very religious, but not just because it was the cool thing to do in the area. It's because they truly thought it, you know. Michael was born when I was in junior high, but then I remember having a little sit down meeting with the whole family when mom and dad told us that they found out that Michael did have some major birth defects. With my brother Michael then, it was, we were super excited. We knew that there were potential risks, but. but when he was born, he did have those problems and they were serious enough that he, he couldn't laugh. They only lived for 55 minutes. My parents had spent what little time they could with him before he passed away and that he passed away. And that was, that was really hard for us. It was wonderful to have all of us together, you know, united at that time, but um, that was sad. You know, we, we miss little Michael. We would like to have had him be in on our adventures and, you know, grow up with us, so. I remember everybody was crying, so I cried because I felt very sad that everybody was sad. I didn't really feel the weight of what it was. I didn't realize what it was. We still think of him. We didn't get to know him very well, but uh, we feel like we're better people because of him. Because where he is, that's where we want to be. And at some point, we'll be able to raise him. And so we're, we're excited for that possibility. When I was on my mission, well, actually when I was in the MTC before I even left, um, then I remember being in one of the meetings and just feeling like Michael's spirit really close. And, um, and he like whispered to me that he was gonna be with me on my mission. The one thing I felt bad about Michael, our youngest one that died, I thought, well, I really wanted to show you the world that we live in. I think I've gotten a lot of my love of the outdoors from my dad. My dad loved to be in the outdoors. So because my dad had the rheumatic heart from having a rheumatic fever when he was a child, um, he always had to be very careful to monitor his stress level. And raising such a big family and, you know, with all the challenges that come with that, um, one of the ways that he found to decompress was to go on outings. Vacations were a big deal to my dad and we would go visit relatives or go to Disneyland. We went to Disneyland about every two years. It was every weekend was focused on the family. 
there was either we we're going to plant the garden for the family to teach us how to work or we were going to go do service for somebody to teach us how to serve or we we're going to go play dad loved hikes and they were a lot of fun and we had some specific places we would go to that were really neat and we would go camping probably our favorite park is zion and we'd go down there a couple times a year usually in the fall and in the spring and sometimes in between and Zion was wonderful then, it wasn't so overrun with people. We'd camp, I would Dutch oven cook. And I have a favorite saying, it's called, uh, it's an old German saying, it says, hunger is the best cook. After the kids had hiked and, and got yeah, really hungry, then they'd come home to my Dutch oven potatoes and hamburgers and, and uh, we did uh, cobbler and fruit roll and things like that for dessert. My dad's a, a, a very balanced person and he taught us there was a time to play and there was a time to do music, there was a time to relax and there was a time to work hard. My dad would actually get us up early, early before school even started and there were still sc stars in the sky and we would go swimming at the rec center and then we would come home and mom would have breakfast ready and our lunches ready for school and we would get dressed and we'd school but it just was like such a great refreshing way to start the day. It was hard to get out of bed, but once you got going, it was great. So my parents were always very active with us as far as like exercise and making it fun. One of our family traditions that I really cherished and I've tried to do myself and my own family, but I, I think I fall short of, of uh, dad's great example was, um, to give us a blessing of comfort before each school year. When I was a teenager, if I ever tried to sneak in after the curfew, dad was always there in the front room waiting for me. I was kind of hoped that maybe this time, you know, they're asleep and I can just sneak in and, and forego the lecture. But no, it was like clockwork. He was always there waiting for me and I knew I had a big long lecture I had to listen to before I could go to bed. <laughs> I remember growing up, my mom would often read us the giving tree and be nice to spiders and i i just loved that that we were always taught to be kind and to um care for even the smallest of god's creations and to be respectful and grateful for all that he has given us and and put in our lives like I struggled with reading. I was really behind in reading. I was a smart kid. I was good at math and science and all those different categories, but I had to do summer school because I was really far behind in reading. So my mom would make me come and lay in bed with her every night when all the other kids were downstairs playing and we would read a book and she would read a good portion of it so that I would enjoy hearing a book. And then she would have me read a couple paragraphs here and there and slowly it was where I read more and more until I was reading the book to her. That was just a lot of patience when I know she has 10,000 other things she needed to be doing. She would lay down patiently, hearing the house get torn apart and just focus on me. Mom was very service oriented. Growing up, the way that she would mother us, we knew that she loved us by taking care of everything. And if there was not enough food on the table, it was mom who suffered. She would eat less so that we got what we needed to and would take food, literally take food off of her plate to make sure we were fed. All of my memories of my mom, the whole time I was growing up, she was always either pregnant or had a baby in her arms. <laughs> and I know that that must have been hard on her, but she uh, always uh, was so happy and joyful singing or whistling, you know, the whole, the whole day long. She was always extremely patient. I was considered the the spicy one of the family. My mom would say, you know, Lisa, you just have a little extra spice. And so I knew I wasn't the easiest kid and it was my mom's way of being very sweet. <laughs> so just keeping up with, you know, meals and cleaning up and kids and just, just the whole thing was, you know, a full-time job and then some. And uh, super, you know, now that I'm getting older, I'm like, holy cow, I can't believe all the energy that she had to be able to accomplish everything she did. Cause you know, even at my age, um, she was still running pretty hard. She has so much endurance and she's like, nope, now we need to have fun. And so even though fun for parents, a lot of times is mostly work, 
but it's fun for kids. So my parents did that a lot. Her her father was an Eagle Scout. Her grandfather, I believe, was an honorary, honorary Eagle Scout because he didn't have scouting as a boy, but he was so involved as a leader that, you know, her brother was an Eagle Scout and we were, by golly, we were gonna be Eagle Scouts, whether we liked it or not. Yes, we can attribute getting our Eagles to mom and all of us got our Eagle Scout awards. She had five Eagle Scout pins on her, uh, one of her outfits that she would wear. If you're an Eagle Scout, you tell an employer that, that you're that, and they know that you're a finisher. And that's important in the world of work. My mom's incredibly patient. She'll be in a trying situation, something that's kind of obnoxious, and you know, someone's doing something stupid. And I've seen her just pause. She takes a little breath, she sighs, and then she just turns around and smiles and lets it go. When I was young, when I was little, I only knew that my dad worked at the courthouse in Provo. I thought, well, courthouse, that's where judges work, right? So my dad must be a judge if he goes to work there all the time. And I thought that for sure he dressed up in long black robes and a white curly wig when I was a little bit older and able to go to his work and see what he did. And he showed us all the cool mapping technology and the cool computers and things that he was working with. Then I got a little bit better idea of what he did. He would uh, show us his big drafting table and his cool eraser that he had that was like motorized. So he... when my boss got ready to retire in, what was it, 1994, she asked if I would like to run and I said, yeah, I would. When my father ran for county recorder, I was in junior high. I remember my brother Jason sitting down with me and saying, if dad doesn't win this election, he might have to get a different job. And I remember being, whoa, this is not good. And so for a family home evening, because we always did family home evening, we did a bunch of them that were handing out flyers door to door. We were all out campaigning. We were all handing out flyers all over town, fighting for my dad's job. It was, it was neat. You know, I was proud to see his name on signs and kids at school did ask, hey, is that your dad? And I said, yep. There were a few times it was like, hey, Covington, that's your name. Ha ha ha, that guy's probably your dad. I'm like, yeah, he is my dad. <laughs> I remember the night of the election when they were counting votes and we were all on the edge of our seats. We had an electronic mapping system set up really, really good. We were a beta site for the sophisticated mapping system that we had. I was reading a book on smart cards a few years ago uh, as part of my work and uh, they were talking about uh, digital signatures in land records and that sort of thing and uh, the author was um, you know some somebody in Germany or something uh, and he mentioned that you know great strides have been making it made in the uh, digital signature you know, for legal records uh, field by Randall Covington, the recorder of the Utah County, uh, you know, recorder's office. Um, so that was kind of special to see that in print, <laughs> just uh, out of the blue. Then he went on lots of trips for work where he was training other people in other states and counties how to do the same thing. Right now, there are 3,600 3, recording offices throughout the United States and they're all trying to play catch up and do the same thing that we did. But in 1998, I was sitting in my office. We had a, I had an older lady from up in records that I was talking to and she was concerned about her heart. And I said, oh, I know all about hearts. I've got one of those that's kind of broken. And I started explaining it to her. Whoever he was talking to at the time said that he turned bright white and just fell over. Suddenly the room went, the, my vision went brown and then black and I was gone. I'd had a V attack, that's a ventricular fibrillation. I got a phone call, you need to come right now, Randy's had a V attack. But my parents always kind of had that on the forefront of their mind, that it was possible that my dad could die and leave my mom a widow. He contributed heavily to his, his pension and retirement funds to make sure that she would be covered financially and that we would be okay. I was kind of at that stage in life where you're kind of self-centered and confused and you know, all that kind of stuff. Having a great time in high school, loving life, but also very confused about what I want to do and who I want to be and very 
uh, you know, self-centered teenager. And dad's VTAC really pulls you out of that super quick. I don't think I was even ready to contemplate a world without my dad yet. When my dad came out of surgery, my mom said that she saw him getting wheeled past the room that she was staying in and that they had so many machines hooked up to him and that his skin was just so pale and it just was really scary for her. Um, it was really concerning for her and especially when my dad had the um, heart valve installed like that's probably the the most frightened I've ever seen my mom. Oh, uh, it's the big deal. Like they do the zipper scar and crack your chest open and it's several hours. I think it was supposed to be a four hour surgery and it had gone for six hours. And, you know, we were sitting in the waiting room thinking this can't be good. <laughs> you know, that was taking a lot longer than normal. And again, she, she didn't seem frightened. Like she kept a, a calm face, but we could just tell, you know, she was not herself and she was very, very concerned. When he was having the open heart surgery, um, being kind of on pins and needles through that whole time, um, just because, you know, he would talk it down like, oh, it's not a big deal, but I, I knew open heart surgery was kind of a big deal and there was a, a good chance that uh, there could be complications. Because he would be very strong and act like he was fine. And he was lying, <laughs> but for all the right reasons. So when I say my dad was selfless, he's literally on his deathbed and he's still focused on us. I, I think it takes moments like that of, of, you know, when you contemplate losing somebody to, to help appreciate the moments that you have a lot more. Kind of makes me think more about my own mortality too and what things would i want to make sure were said oh i appreciated being able to stay here on this side of the veil it's always better when you can you know wake up to her face in the morning she'd say every time i see my your dad from across the room i get a little sparkle and it makes me happy and i i just i always want to have that with my spouse because i know what a big deal that was as a kid to live in an environment where your parents just love each other so much. I appreciate Rand a lot because he's one of the most patient people I know. And he's kind and he's good. My parents have always been very committed to each other and they are one another's priority. They and their relationship come first before everything else. They are respectful towards one another. You know, they don't say negative things about each other. Well, we had friends that had parents that were fighting and divorcing and they had stress in their homes. We never had to question that our parents were 110% devoted to one another. I was at one of my friend's houses and I was complaining that my parents were out on a date. And why do they always have to go on a date? They go on dates, they try to every week. And I remember my friend saying, just like taking a deep breath and going, ah, wish my parents would go on a date. Cause her parents didn't have a very good relationship at all. And that really taught me something right there. I, I it just kind of took me back and I realized, wow, I was being very selfish. Like. It really was important for them to go on dates and it really did help them. When I was a kid, I never worried about whether my parents loved each other or not. I knew for sure that they did. So when I was looking for a partner, I was looking for the person who I want them to be my best friend because I saw that in my parents. They were definitely best friends and more than best friends, they were like a team. They worked together very well. When my dad was getting ready for retirement, um, I was 15 years old. So I had my driver's permit and I remember my mom was trying to put some bowls up into a cab cabinet above her head, and she couldn't. I think that and he had his heart surgery and had that attack, and well, it was so traumatic to me. I think that's why I start, when I started to show the signs of Parkinson's, I first became really aware that something was wrong when I was out. North Florida. Bed. Many, many years before my mom was diagnosed with Parkinson's and she was out weeding in a flower bed at their, our house and a neighbor walked by and commented on how beautiful the flowers smelled and my mom realized she couldn't smell them at all. And I thought, 
I'm not walking as fast and I'm not swinging my arms and I can't smell. We had an idea of what it was going to be like because her father had Parkinson's for about 30 years. And so we knew what happened. You start out with the, the symptoms and then they get worse and worse and worse. And we assumed that it was just going to be kind of a downhill thing. Growing up with Grandpa Thompson and, and knowing of his concerns with Parkinson's, it was always a lingering possibility. I had to go on some eight hour drives to get my driver's license. And one day my dad and I decided to drive down to St. George and back to get our hours. And, and I remembered my dad crying and I don't think I'd ever seen my dad cry. And he said, I just don't know what life is gonna be like without your mom. And, um, <clears throat> and at the time they didn't know how long it would last so I think um, yeah that was that was a, a big deal when my mom got diagnosed with Parkinson's and I think it was really scary for a little while and then they both got really determined to fight it. And I remember we were walking the track we we're getting our evening exercise and we stopped and we just hugged you know which was a symbol of of the solidarity we had we're in this together we're gonna do the best we can. You know, first dad is sick and unhealthy and now he finally gets his heart valve transplant and he's doing better or, you know, life is, is looking better for him. And now my mom gets diagnosed with Parkinson's. Like, come on, can we get a break and just have them both be healthy for once? Because they had always dreamed of like going on a mission together and just enjoying retirement together. But that kind of like threw a wrench into their, their plans. So the typical with Parkinson's is that as soon as anything goes wrong, um, say that it's a, uh, that you're starting to tremble, that starting to tremble doesn't go away. It's there for the rest of your life. And that has not been the case with mom. New symptoms come and they go. And I attribute that to the service that she gives in the support group and in other capacities too. They do a lot for a lot of different people, particularly people who are suffering from Parkinson's, but giving a view of this does not have to be the end of the road debilitating disease that others will tell you that it is. My parents have been very active members of this support group. We run a support group. We meet with them once a month. My parents have been a big example to other people who are going through similarly very difficult situations. It gives them hope and helps them to feel like they're not alone. Because here's an example right in front of you of someone who's been able to long-term deal with the disease and have it work out the way that it needs to in a positive way. A great example, I think, to everybody there of, of both the person with Parkinson's and the one that's supporting them. I've had to have more and more help, and he's the one who's the first to give up. And then our daughter, Jenny, has been an angel too. She's helped us out for years. She's a great caretaker for mom because Jenny just takes care of things the way that mom wants them done and knows exactly what that is. In working with my parents and spending time with them, I felt like I've gotten to know them really well. Having nine kids, it's kind of hard to have one-on-one -on -one time. I think their legacy is we should love and care for those relationships and those responsibilities that God puts in our lives. Mom's tiring service is something that I always aspire to, to be able to take on incredible challenges and be able to just move forward with them and make it work out. I would say I probably learned a lot of nurturing from my mom, responsibility for, you know, for my kids and those that, that I have responsibility for. She's taught me a lot of accountability and and to sacrifice. She always has had a long vision and, you know, had faith that what she was doing was going to lead to good outcomes and, and it did. My mom has always befriended people who struggle socially. She's always reached out to the underdogs and has just been kind to them. She's an amazing example of kindness. So my mom has impacted who I am today because she gives me like a, like the best example of what I wish I could be as a mom. My mom always had something that was broken. I loved tinkering with stuff. She she always gave it to me to fix it. Um, 
expecting that I'd fix it, which was crazy to have that kind of confidence that I would actually be able to like successfully fix the toaster. But I wouldn't have had confidence in my kid to fix it. And her confidence uh, gave me a lot of confidence. And so still to this day, I jump into projects that are way beyond what I can do, but I have the confidence that I will, I'll, I'll figure it out. You know, I'll get through it and I'll figure it out. My mom definitely instilled that in me. Like never, never seemed to be tired or, you know, she just, Always put on a happy face and keep going. Man, she got sick one time. She had like 103 degree fever and we were trying to force her to stay in bed because she won't stop working. She's such a great teacher. And I feel like that she was just always like teaching. I think it just like really embedded it inside of me. I think the biggest value that my dad instilled in me was a value of hard work and not giving up. Yeah, you know, some of the things that I know that he went through in his life, he was able to find forgiveness and peace and love people anyway. And that's been a big example to me. A good example of what a man, what a husband and a father should be for me and my kids. He's loving, he's determined, he's hardworking, he's self-reliant. My dad would always invite people over to have dinner at our house. And it was always people that maybe other family members wouldn't invite over because of their beliefs or or what they were doing in their lives. He'd be doing something, he'd be frustrated with it. He'd be bothering him quite a bit and I'd come up and, hey dad, can I help? And instantly he was kind to me. You know, he, he dropped his frustration with what he was doing and he didn't take that frustration and, and lash at me. Um, he compartmentalized very well. One of the big things that we will always remember mom and dad for is the way that they loved each other, that they were always together in everything that they did. Their biggest legacy, I know what's most important to them is their family. When they were deciding what mattered in life, they put all of their energy and all of their love and all of their work into having an awesome family. <laughs> I can say most the attributes I see in my brothers and sisters that I really like a lot, I see in my parents and that's where they got it. My parents, that they have taught us all to respect other people, to respect life. I talked to my cousins. Um, a lot of them didn't really have a father figure growing up and my dad kind of filled that void for them. And uh, pretty much all of them love, 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 love both of my parents to the greatest people they've ever met. If I had a message to give to my descendants, I'd tell them that what my motto was. This is what I made in, in primary. And it says, greet the day with a song, make others happy and serve gladly. And I found that if, if a person does all three of those things, their life is really full and good. It turns out that you're, you're happy and you spread joy and happiness. Work hard, love the Lord, say your prayers, seek after truth. I don't want to dictate what they do with their lives on the one side, hand, and yet on the other hand there are some things that bring a lot of a lot of satisfaction to their life. And some of those things that have brought satisfaction to my life has been uh, to, to have a testimony of Christ and His atonement. We want our kids to, to improve with time. And that's, that's all the gospel of Christ is. You know, He's there to, to, to say, okay, you made a mistake, let's erase it and move on with your life. And as parents, that's the same feeling that we want for our kids, is whatever's amiss in your life, correct it and move on. We love you, Grandma and Grandpa. Bye. We love, we love you, Grandma and Grandpa. You're the best. We love, love you. You've always been so supportive of me. I love you. Grandma and Grandpa, thanks for being so supportive and kind. I love you. Thanks for letting me do Sudoku at your house. I love you. A few years back, Grandma and Grandpa showed me how to make gourmet treats. It was a lot of hard work, but after we were finally finished, we were able to share it with the family. And it sparked a love for baking in me. And 
I just like to say thank you very much, Grandma and Grandpa, and I love you. I love growing up, hearing the stories from your childhood. Love you, Grandma and Grandpa. We love you so much, Grandma and Grandpa. Thank you so much for taking good care of us when we come and visit you. And we really appreciate you guys supporting us and all of our life changes and accomplishments. And we really had so much fun on our trip to St. George with you guys. Hey, Grandma and Grandpa. I love all the memories of uh, going to cool places like the Dinosaur Museum as a kid. I really appreciate that, and uh, I love you both. I love you, Grandma and Grandpa. Love you, Grandma and Grandpa. We love you, Grandma and Grandpa. Love you guys. We love you guys, and you guys are one of my awesomest Grandma and Grandpas. So that's why I love you. Happy birthday, Grandma and Grandpa. I love you a lot. Hello, Grandma and Grandpa. I love you guys. Hi, Grandma and Grandpa. I love you guys so very much. I'm so grateful that you are my grandparents, and I'm so blessed by your Christ-like examples, by the love and love that you have for all of us. I love you, Grandma and Grandpa.